Hello everyone and welcome back to the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum Colorado Grown Digital Event. We're so excited to be celebrating Colorado's birthday. We turn 144 today on August 1st and of course also August 18th, August 19, uh, 20, 1920. Uh, we are 100 years out from the passage of the 19th Amendment which granted women the constitutional right to vote. So we've prepared for you a fabulous day of digital events. We've already have a few earlier today and a couple more um, all the way up till two o'clock. So we hope you can tune in throughout the day. You of course can register and see these videos, these programs through Zoom, or we're also live on Facebook. So I'm so excited um, to welcome and thank you so much Leah Davis Witherow for joining us today. Leah is the curator of history at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. And we opened a brand new exhibit called This Shall Be the Land for Women. Since Leah cannot really offer you a tour in person, we thought it would be kind of neat to do a digital tour of this special exhibit. So thank you so much, Leah, for your time. Absolutely. Happy Saturday, everyone. And uh, happy Colorado Grown Day. Happy Colorado Day. It's the anniversary of our state's entry into the Union. Um, let me see if I can get this set up. Awesome. So although I wish I could give you all a personal tour, of course I can't right now, but during the COVID-19 stay at home order, we opened up our latest exhibit, This Shall Be the Land for Women. I'll tell you a little bit more about that title in a second, but we're thrilled to be able to share with our visitors the history of women's suffrage. And this is a momentous year, as Meg said, it is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. But for those of you that have heard me tell this story before, um, Colorado has an even more interesting story because we didn't wait for the ratification of the 19th Amendment to allow women to vote in our state. We actually, women gained it here by popular referendum in 1893, almost a full 27 years before the 19th Amendment. So I have up on this uh, on the screen now a uh, photograph of our exhibit. It's on the third floor just outside the, the beautifully restored Division I courtroom. So I hope you have a chance to visit in person. The goal today is to share with you some of my favorite stories and my favorite artifacts. So let's get started. All right, um, not only did Colorado women gain the right to vote before 1920, but about 4 million other American women, primarily in the West, had the right to vote before the federal amendment. So if you take a look at this map, you can see all the states in the West that granted women the right to vote, either through popular referendum or through legislative measures. Um, this map is really powerful because it tells you the story that this was a movement from West to East Unlike uh, most of these sort of intellectual, political, or reform movements, we typically think happen from east to west. So to, for starters, you can't talk about suffrage or the act of the franchise or voting without seeing a really fun ballot box. How would you feel to be dropping off your ballot in the late 19th, early 20th century in a, <laughs> a glass ballot box where uh, you might not have your privacy? Uh, of course, up until the Australian or secret ballot was adopted in the early 20th century, people actually sometimes voted in person. They voted in their workplace or their church and they voted by raising their hand. And so if you were voting in your workplace and your boss was there as the election clerk, he or she knew exactly how you were voting. So ballot boxes and Australian ballot were important measures to protect the privacy of voting. So that's one of my favorite artifacts on exhibit. And we have at least three or four ballot boxes in our collection. So it's fun to be able to bring them out 
and put them on exhibit. And of course, uh, in addition to ballot boxes, we have ballots. So I told you that women in Colorado were voting in 1893. That meant we could vote in state and national elections, but women had actually been able to vote in local school district elections in Colorado as early as 1877. It's what was called half a loaf. When Colorado became a state, yay Colorado grown day, yay Colorado statehood, uh, women weren't extended the franchise, but they were allowed to vote in school district elections because of course the education of their children was seen as their particular purview, their expertise. So women had been voting locally. And then in 1894, the first election where Colorado women went to the polls, they were voting on statewide and national issues. So in our collection, this is really fun. This is maybe not a fun issue to vote on, whether El Paso County would take on more public indebtedness. Believe it or not, this has been a controversial topic throughout our community's history. But nevertheless, if we look at this ballot, look at all the women. I've starred them for you. And in addition to women voting, there were women election judges up on top and election clerks. And there's nothing like seeing the power of a woman's voice as to see her signature on a ballot. And so I love this particular artifact and you can see it in person when you come to the museum. So the, the story of how Colorado women gained the right to vote in 1893 is really complex and I don't have time to get into all the details with you here today, but we recently had three fantastic presentations that are all available on the CSPM YouTube channel um, by three local scholars that tell the story of 1877, 1893 and 1920. But I would be remiss in talking about women's right to vote in Colorado without specifically mentioning Elizabeth Piper Ensley. She's featured here. This is her beautiful photograph on the right. Elizabeth Piper Ensley was the treasurer of the Nonpartisan Equal Suffrage Association of Colorado in 1893 and helped devise this brilliant four-pronged strategy of pulpit, press, populism and prohibition. If any of you are available, um, the staff and I are giving a downtown walking tour next Saturday at 10 a.m. You can find more information about it through downtown partnership, but we're gonna be telling in great detail the story of this four P, four prong uh, strategy to gain women the right to vote in 1893. So I hope to see some of you there. Nevertheless, Elizabeth Piper Ensley, we don't have any of her original artifacts. So what is a museum to do when we don't have artifacts on hand? We wanted to share some facsimiles. So this lift as we climb, this beautiful purple banner was actually the, the motto for the National Association of Colored Women's Club banner. Uh, Elizabeth Piper Ensley was not only involved in women's suffrage in Colorado, education measures, reform work, but she was an important leader in the Colorado Colored Women's Association and the Colorado Women's Federation of Clubs. She was really, really important and helped integrate the Colorado, uh, the Federation of Women's Clubs in Colorado. And this beautiful banner, Lift As We Climb, is again the national motto. Um, and it really speaks to the idea in late 19th, early 20th century politics and social reform movements is if, if black women lifted themselves up, lifted their status up socially by reform efforts, education efforts, et cetera, they would lift up their whole community. The work wasn't just for themselves, but for their whole community. And the same can be said regarding women's suffrage. Women felt like they didn't just want the vote for themselves, they also wanted to put it to work. They wanted to improve their communities, clean up their communities, and sort of act as a moral force in, in Colorado Springs, the Pikes Peak region, and other places. So we don't have an original object. We have a beautiful facsimile, facsimile for you to see. One of the P's that's just too fun not to mention is prohibition. So we had to, <laughs> we went through our collection. Um, believe it or not, we have quite a few whiskey bottles or liquor bottles in our collection, and of course, that speaks to the fact that even though we were a dry town, you could always find liquor if you wanted to in Colorado Springs, sometimes at local pharmacies. So we tell that story in our new evidence exhibit uh, that delves into the life of General William Jackson Palmer, but I'll, I'll speak to it briefly here. Women used the 
they used prohibition and proponents of suffrage used prohibition to encourage voters to grant women the right to vote, meaning they felt that liquor had become a problem and liquor and the abuse of liquor dramatically impacted the lives of women and children. So by giving women the right to vote, they would help clean up, uh, clean up a town, clean up a, a region. They would help enact prohibition and it's to help establish a more law and order form of government. Um, and the truth is when women did get the right to vote, they did help vote in prohibition. So uh, the liquor interests were always actively organized against women's suffrage. So this is one of our liquor bottles. And if you saw it in person, it's actually quite large. It's a, it's a, a big container of liquor. Women before and after the 19th Amendment have always worked really hard to improve our community, all communities across the country. And in Colorado Springs specifically, a group of very active women and some men joined the, formed the Colorado Springs Civic League. And they were a group that sought to improve parks. They wanted to provide more public amenities like playgrounds and water fountains. They also really requested and then demanded that Colorado Springs City Council pay more attention to planning. Once again, when you study history, you find out there is really no such thing as a new issue. Um, planning and growth, they wanted to be pursued in a thoughtful way. And actually, as a result of the advocacy of the Colorado Springs Civic League, the first female member, the first woman was elected to the local planning commission here in Colorado Springs and a planning commission was formed. One of my favorite artifacts, and if you know me, you know all the artifacts are my favorite, but one of my favorite artifacts is the Civic League Bulletin where they, the Civic League members promoted and discussed all of their activities in Colorado Springs, all of their promotional, educational and reform activities. But on the cover is the emblem that was actually created by the Colorado Springs Civic League and is now, of course, placed on our Colorado Springs city flag. And they designed it, they placed it, uh, they put forth the design to city council. They had a bit of a discussion, a tussle, and they kept putting it forth. And eventually this was adopted as our city flag. So you can see the sunshine. We are the city of sunshine. I can't quite see that the ring around it is green, but that of course uh, stands for or symbolizes our, our wealth of city parks. Pikes Peak is in the background. Those are gold ingots in the foreground. It almost looks like a smiley face, but it's not. And then the white background, of course, is our clean, healthful air that drew thousands and thousands of health seekers to our community. So although you can't see inside of the Civic Bulletin, I wanted you to see the, the outside cover. We have some of these in the archives and so does PPLD. So if you wanna research, you wanna look into it more, please make an appointment with either our special collections or PPLD to read more about this really important group. One of the most notable members was none other than Lillian Kerr, who in 1924 ran for Congress in the 24th district. She wasn't elected, but she was a tireless advocate for our community, prominent member of the Civic League, very involved in the women's suffrage movement here in Colorado and in Colorado Springs in particular. Here's one of my favorite quotes. She essentially says, women need the right to vote because they need to clean up the messes that men <laughs> have created. Lillian, Care helped draft the language for what would become the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, she also lobbied city council to create in 1924-25, the first municipal utilities department. In other words, take utilities out of the hands of private enterprise, co consolidate them under the city so that residents would have the best prices, would have the most economically efficient means of operating ele electric and gas services. Uh, and Drake Power Plant was actually a result of her advocacy. This is a photograph of the 19, uh, in 1915 of the National Women's Party headquarters in Colorado. There was such a strident and effective group of suffragists in Colorado Springs that uh, um, Alice Paul and other leaders of the National Women's Party actually decided to place the headquarters in Colorado Springs rather than in Denver, Colorado. 
the women here were really active. And I have to say, in looking back through historical evidence, the Chamber of Commerce was incredibly supportive. They encouraged groups of suffragists on special trains and other groups to come west to have meetings here. They actually thought that it would be an interesting draw to our region to bring women and suffragists and parades, et cetera, to Colorado Springs. So this photograph was taken on North Tejon Street. So it's an artifact in the exhibit. And essentially, this is where Jose Muldoon's is today, by the way. You've probably seen this photograph if you've looked at any or if you've been party to any of our other programs. But I wanted to share it with you today because it's just so fantastic. And in this group of people are some of the most notable prom uh, and prominent suffragists in Colorado Springs. Now, an incredibly piece, uh, incredible piece of ephemera is featured here on the left. We discovered this in our collections about 25 years ago and instantly knew how important it was. Ephemera is ephemeral by its very nature. And this was a broadside that would have been posted or handed out. It's printed on really, really cheap newsprint. So it wasn't meant to have a long lifespan and we're extremely grateful that it ended up in our collections, that someone saved it and donated it to the museum. So it's on exhibit. So it says, come to the equal rights pageant in the Garden of the Gods. You can see they've had to cross out the date. Apparently September 16th didn't work out and they had to push it back an additional week. And we know by reading the Gazette that they were struggling to fundraise for this national pageant that drew uh, political leaders, drew suffragists, drew activists and and onlookers from around the country who came to Colorado Springs on the 75th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention. And they were promoting, this is 1923, so they're actually, women had gained the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. They're actually promoting an Equal Rights Amendment. Again, that was partially written by Lil, our own Lillian Kerr here in Colorado Springs. So they came to Garden of the Gods. They had this beautiful pageant. You can see the banner, the banner bearers there. They had people dressed in historic costumes, uh, dressed up as historical figures like Helen Hunt Jackson and Lucretia Mott. It was a spectacle. One of the things people often don't notice is if you look in the foreground, there's a trench and there are a series of photographers and reporters there who are all trying to capture an image of this grand spectacle. And these photographs are all in the Library of Congress. They are uh, publicly available. They're really wonderful if you have time and interest to look into them. And recently, the suffragist in Garden of the Gods was reenacted. 100 women were chosen to march in a St. Patrick's Day parade here in Colorado Springs. Unfortunately, that was canceled. But some of them made their way out to Garden of the Gods recently and took a modern photograph. In not exactly the same place, but with the same idea of strong women gathering to advocate for women in the Pikes Peak region. So this piece of ephemera is fantastic. Uh, I hope you get to see it in person. This is a surprise. I told you I was going to share some of our favorite artifacts. This came in very recently, in fact, within the last year, and we're thrilled. It is a personal invitation. You can see it's handwritten there, Miss Arthur Jones, from Julie Penrose to come to a reception being held on Saturday evening, September 22nd, for national attendees of the pageant in the Garden of the Gods. So Mrs. Penrose held a private reception for some of the guests at El Pomar. It is a fantastic connection. We often don't think of Julie Penrose in that way. We don't have any evidence that she was a suffragist herself or even supported the ERA but she was inviting attendees to a private reception here in Colorado Springs. It's kind of a tacit approval perhaps. So it's a really interesting piece of local history. That's what's exciting about working in a museum is that new things come in all the time. So we re recently received this and we knew right away that it was going to go on exhibit. And then it's really fun to look for the, the sentiments either pro or con women's suffrage in our ephemera collection. So a few years ago, when looking through our postcard collection, we came across this fantastic image. It's a, a, a Valentine's Day card promoting women's rights and women's suffrage. 
um, it just gives you a chuckle. And it's, a, again, a wonderful piece of ephemera that we're thrilled made its way into our collection. We're always looking for that kind of popular culture evidence the, to examine how people in the Pikes Peak region felt or responded to any regional, state, national, international change. And we can often find it in manuscripts, correspondence, and sometimes in postcards and ephemera. It's really fun. I finally, I wanted to end um, on at this quote with Ellis Meredith. I have given you such a fast overview of this exhibit. Um, and this is a really complex issue, uh, women's suffrage in Colorado and also in the United States. Ellis Meredith has often been called the Susan B. Anthony of Colorado. She was a journalist, a tireless advocate, and she stated, equal suffrage is not an end, it is a beginning. It is the commencement of responsibilities and opportunities so vast that time itself is hardly long enough to work out all the problems before us. In 1893, in 1920, and in 2020, we're still faced with great challenges. Uh, and having the right to vote is not a luxury and it's not a gift, it is an obligation and it's a responsibility. So some of the greatest artifacts in the exhibit are words, are words from Elizabeth Piper Ensley, Ellis Meredith and local suffragists who dedicated their lives so that we today would enjoy our franchise and hopefully exercise it. I wanna thank you all so much for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Happy Colorado Day once again and thanks everybody. Yes, thank you so much, Leah. Absolutely, we probably have time for one question. So um, if any of our folks tuning in via Zoom wanted to post a question in the chat box, uh, go for it. And I can't see it, Meg, so if you could tell me okay. what it is. <laughs> ready. We'll see if we, we get any questions. Just as a, a quick note while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, um, coming up next, it's lunchtime. I'm sure everybody's getting a little bit hungry. We encourage you to grab something to eat and we have about 45 minutes of live music that we're presenting of course via Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, they are tuning in all the way from New Orleans. They're called the New Orleans Rhythm Regulators and they're going to play a variety of songs from this time period. So we hope you'll come back at noon for that. And it looks like we have one question, Leah, from um, Madeline. She asked, why did suffrage begin in the West and move East instead of the other way around? Oh, that's such a fantastic question. Uh, short answer is uh, tireless activists, grassroots movements, and economics. Um, populism was incredibly popular in the West, primarily because of a series of economic recessions that really devastated Western mining interests, banking interests, etc. And people felt like they needed to find their own solutions to political and economic problems. And to do that, they were open to giving the right to vote to women so they could help solve the problems and double the power of their vote, frankly. Uh, meaning more people in Colorado could vote if women were granted the franchise. That's a very short answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Leah. Um, we are going to go ahead and wrap it up, but I hope you all have a great rest of your day and can join us for the next few programs we have coming up. Thank Thanks, you again. Thanks, everybody. Bye.